Hopefully you won't be able to hear too much. Hello everyone, welcome to Gardening Gnomes. We are do celebrating National Pollinator Week. So happy National Pollinator Week, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been posting daily pollinators this week. We are having this fun little discussion about pollinators and pollinator gardening. Uh, and uh, we just are so excited to share uh, with you. So my name is Rachel Davis. I am Gateway's horticulturist here at the Arboretum and Public Garden. Uh, I am here with my new co-host and he will introduce himself. Hello, I'm Riley Schultz. I'm the Habitat Horticulture Co-Coordinator with the University Arboretum in Public Garden. And I'm also a landscape architecture student. So I'm happy to talk about how you can provide space for bees in your gardens. And awesome. other pollinators. <laughs> and other pollinators. Yeah. And habitat overall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Cool. So we are going to go through a slideshow um, and just share a little bit about what's up uh, at the Arboretum, also on campus. So let me get that up for us. All right. So uh, even this was one of the posts that we just shared this week taken by Lauren Glevenick, uh, our intern for Habitat Horticulture, uh, also all-star iNaturalist observer. Uh, and some of you may have seen her at some of our previous garden gnomes. Um, program. So uh, ways to celebrate. Um, so if this National Pollinator Week is June 22nd to 28th this year. Uh, nationally, the Pollinator Partnership uh, is kind of putting on National Pollinator Week. So you can check out their website, see what kind of resources they have. Uh, there's actually a map on there of all the different events happening all over the country. Xerces Society also has a really great blog for some resources for that too, as well as tons of plant lists and information uh, about how to support pollinators. Uh, locally, the Honey Bee Haven, Hagen dazs Honey Bee Haven, uh, was just given permission to hold tours in person again. I believe you do have to sign up uh, for that, but uh, Christine Casey, who manages that garden, uh, she will be giving those. She's also been uh, providing some slideshows on the website for you to see what's been happening during the spring. So go ahead and check out uh, beegarden.ucdavis.edu for uh, more information there. Uh, the garden is looking amazing there. Uh, also for the Arboretum, we are um, having uh, some read aloud pollinator books. So super happy to offer those. Uh, students for, from our team, Habitat Horticulture, are reading those this week. So, so far we've had Bees Are the Best uh, about uh, a honeybee who learns about all the biodiversity of other bees in the, the nation. Also, uh, If Hummingbirds Could Hum, which is a really cool collaborative book produced through UC Davis, lots of different departments. Uh, so go ahead and check those out. Those are posted on our Facebook page, also on YouTube and IP Video. Uh, so if you did not know, UC Davis is a B Campus USA. So this is an initiative through the Xerces Society. And we have gotten committee members from the Department of Entomology and Nematology, the Student Farm, Honey and Pollination Center, Hagen does uh, Honey Bee Haven, and CalPERS students. And uh, the, the Arboretum Public Garden chairs this project. So go ahead and check out our website. We're trying to add more resources for you there. And even though it's called B Campus USA, this initiative is for all pollinators. So um, it's a really great way to plan on, you know, having habitat for all pollinators on our campus. There is also a B City USA program, which is similar for cities. And actually, Woodland, California, our neighbor, is a B City USA. So. Uh, it's been great to work with them as we learn how to provide these resources for you all. And uh, from some other Garden Gnomes projects, you've heard about our iNaturalist project. And so I just wanted to highlight a few of the common pollinators that we've been seeing in spring. So we saw a lot of sweat bees. 
they are really cute and fun to take photos of. They're very busy, but they're kind of <laughs> easy to take photos of. Uh, this one is on our native Achillea millifolium, which is yarrow. Uh, Texas striped sweat bee is this really cool green metallic bee that you can see flashes of it as it flies by. This is visiting a desert mallow. Uh, the painted ladies often migrate through this area in spring, so that's why, like, seasonally you'll see them in the spring. Um, and so we captured some of those. Really good to see them coming through on this uh, island bush poppy. Yellow-faced bumblebees. If you saw this photo close up, you would see that, like, the whole head and face is yellow. So um, they are visiting... It's not a native snapdragon, but uh, the snapdragons are really great for these bumblebees. They are have tons of flowers and they bloom for a pretty long time locally. And of course, the Western tiger swallowtail, been seeing a bunch of those out here. Um, they are loving these plants like the um, island verbena. So uh, we've planted those a bunch in the arboretum. It's a really popular garden plant. So. Uh, these are just some of the top ones that we've been seeing this spring while we've been sheltering in place. And wanted to talk a little bit about multi-pollinator supporting plants. So if you want to get the most bang for your buck as far as like what you can attract to your garden and just kind of like in a generalist way, uh, First one is the autumn sages. So these are not native to California, but they're native to the Southwest US. So autumn sages and baby sages, I guess they're called. Um, so Salvia gregii, Salvia microcarpa, and uh, the hybrid heminensis, which is actually a hybrid between gregii and microphylla. So uh, these are just what we suggest. We always have them in stock. They're in so many different colors. If you trim them back often, uh, they will rebloom like crazy, uh, but typically if you only want to do it once a year, that's in January, February, and then they just re-sprout nicely and um, they look really great and produce lots of really colorful flowers that are long blooming. But as always, our native sages, uh, like the Brandigi sage and the Cleveland sage, uh, they get a little bit bigger. They're a little more woody, <laughs> but those attract everything too. So we highly recommend pretty much any sage. Yeah. Um, bladder pod, California native, uh, that attracts everybody. It's a very large shrub. Abby featured this in her garden gnome series. Um, it gets kind of big, uh, at least five feet wide, I think maybe four to five feet tall. Um, and, but it flowers most of the year. I think maybe there's a month a year that it doesn't have any flowers because it's resting <laughs> from all that flower production. Um, Foothill penstemon. Uh, while this is great and it attracts everybody, it also prefers a little bit more well-drained soil. So locally, it can be a little testy. So it's, it's prolific bloomer. It's not super long lived, but it does attract everybody. So if you can afford to like replace it every few years, um, right? And have like at least not fully clay soil, then um, that one is highly recommended and beautiful. So that, that one is specifically Margarita Bach, which we always carry. Yeah. Or if you have a nice slope for it, it'll be great there. Yeah, exactly. If you have a nice slope that like just helps that water drain a little bit more. Thanks, Riley. Uh, also, coyote mint, very available on the market. Uh, this also, even though you can't see it as well, you can see on the other flowers, they kind of have that tubular shape, which is great for our hummingbirds. On the coyote mint, they're just really teeny little tubes <laughs> on one flowering head. So they're still attract hummingbirds, but uh, I do see a lot of the bees and butterflies on that. And you can see this spider on here. Uh, it's crab spider uh, hunting for food, but that also is an indicator that there's probably a lot of visitation on this flower. So yep. I'd say that's, that's a good spot. indicator. <laughs> <laughs> and we have so many plants that fit this category, but these are just a few to share. Um, one thing I also want to mention, if you want to do even more bang for your buck, uh, if they could be host plants for 
butterflies, that would be even better. The only thing for this, though, is uh, something like narrow milkweed. So it is a host plant for a monarch. It attracts tons of different insects uh, for, um, uh, yeah, it supports tons of different insects. And the only thing is, because it attracts so many things and gets so much visitation, this is also a place where we find a lot of disease that can be transferred across all these different organisms. So that's one thing to consider as you're thinking about, oh, can I get, you know, generalist insects and other pollinators to come to this plant? So just think about the potential of transferring disease. Yeah. So a general good way to avoid that is to, instead of planting things in a massive group, you can break them up with another type of plant that might not attract all of the pollinators in between them. Yeah. So there's different ideas for like design. So sometimes you want to put like five to seven of the same plant in one clump uh, so that the pollinators don't have to go as far. But also like if you have a really biodiverse garden, like lots of different, like seven species or something, um, you could kind of interplant a little bit more. But also you can decide instead in your garden to attract specialists. Like there's about seven species in this area uh, that are sunflower specialists who also visit uh, cactus flowers and mallow flowers. So just as you're con contemplating what you want in your garden, you can think about like even the health of these pollinators. Anything else on that, Riley? I think you've pretty much covered it. <laughs> okay. So other plants to consider. These are also kind of just like my favorites. Uh, these are thought to be weeds. Uh, in some, yeah, some people consider these kind of weedy, but they are all natives and they're really great for pollin pollinators. So alkali mallow, also in the Malvaceae family, uh, it's just... It's kind of this, it's a perennial, but it comes up in disturbed areas often. It's like a mat of these silvery uh, green leaves, but they attract butterflies and bees. They're really cute little flowers. Um, they do seed and they, but they don't like, they're not invasive, but they're really, really uh, great. I think they're summer flowering too. So uh, they provide some food during the hotter times of the year. Yeah. Vinegar weed, Riley's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> smells like glue. <laughs> some people like it, some people don't. <laughs> it is another kind of it's annual flower. It's a little stinky, hence the vinegar weed. But it does flower in the summer as far as annual wildflowers. It's a great one to kind of take those spaces in your garden. And the really teeny little bees, as you can see right here, um, are attracted to them. And a lot of those bees do come out more in the summer too. Yeah. And then one of my all time favorite is this cobweb thistle. So Circium occidental. It is amazing. You can see that it uh, supports butterflies. It has even just on these, this one flower has three different bee species. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of flies and other insects actually uh, oviposits, which means they leave, they lay their eggs inside the flowering head. Uh, and a lot of those are beneficial insects. So I highly recommend this California native. It is a thistle, but it is not like a crazy take over your yard type thistle. Um, and on the coast, this can be sometimes perennial, but I think here I've been watching it and it's a little bit more annual. So one of my favorites. And it's a great host plant because it provides a lot of protection for a lot of things because it's spiky like a thistle. And you mentioned something early about deadheading it potentially. Yeah. So if you're worried about it seeding around or you can even do this with the less native thistles, you can just deadhead them and they'll still provide their host plant function because uh, painted ladies love the other thistles that come up in the area. Cool, definitely. All right, just some quick ID questions that I often run into. So uh, I talk about this a lot, actually. So the difference between bees and flies. So the hoverfly on the right is often mistaken with a bee, but 
they are mimicking them on purpose, right? So uh, bees have longer antennae versus these short stubby guys right here. Um, the wings rest on the back of the bee versus at this 45 degree angle generally. Oops, you can't see it. Okay, the eyes are long and on the sides of the face versus the flies are kind of like round and take up almost the whole head. <laughs> uh, so that's just a quick ID on bees versus flies. Flies are really great pollinators, at least the flower flies are. Uh, maybe not as efficient, like this one isn't as hairy, um, but they also are beneficial bugs because their larvae eat uh, pesty things like aphids. Sorry, I did not finish formatting this, <laughs> but um, we see a lot of carpenter bees in our garden. And I've been getting a lot of uh, emails from people in the community asking what this, this bee is. And I'm like, oh, they think it's a bumblebee. They also think this female is too, but these carpenter bees um, are really cool. They tend to robber be some of these flowers. Uh, so when they can't fit into these tubular flowers that are uh, highly attractive to hummingbirds. So they use their mandibles and they poke a hole to steal some of that nectar. Um, so yes, they do this. Yes, they're stealing it, but I'm kind of okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> we still want them in the garden. Um, but yeah, the females are all black valley carpenter bees. And the males are often called like teddy bear bees because they're so fuzzy and cute. Um, so just to show you the difference of that, again, I've been getting a lot of questions about these because they're a lot bigger, so you can see them a little bit easier too. Yeah, they sound like little helicopters if they go by your ear. <laughs> yes, and uh, even though the females kind of sometimes hover close to you, they most likely will not sting you. Uh, They'll only really be aggressive if you're near their nest or like poke a hole in their nest. So don't do that. <laughs> but they're they're really great bees and don't be too afraid of them, even though they look a little scary <laughs> if they're hovering near you. Okay. Uh, and you can actually pet. Don't do it. Actually, don't do it. <laughs> the, the males don't sting at all. Uh, they do not have stingers. Only females have stingers. But... They're just so fuzzy. I kind of just want to pet it. But don't, don't. I do not recommend that. <laughs> uh, and this has just been really fun to find in the garden, uh, sleepy bees. So the male bees of a lot of these ground nesting native bees, uh, they aren't welcome in the nest. Uh, the females are busy provisioning them. The males get to sleep outside on flowers. Uh, so it's such a fun, uh, thing to find when we're in the garden. I also just want to mention it too, because if you're in the garden in the early morning and you're just like tromping through, uh, you might be disturbing these sleeping guys because I have seen them sleep until like 10 a.m. <laughs> if they're like in the shade still, yeah. Um, the, the sun and the warmth generally warms them up, but uh, I've been finding these guys sleeping in a little late. So just to be aware of them, um, they're super cute and you might find some like a little surprise in your garden with these yeah. little male natives. That's why it's great to have some of those cup to like Malva flowers like we saw on the earlier slide with the, what was it, vinegar? Not the vinegar weed, the other one. Uh, alkali mallow. <laughs> the alkali mallow, because it's a nice low lying cup that they can rest in and it's pretty hidden. Yeah. Oh, and I just need to remind everyone that we are checking our comments and questions. So if you have any, go ahead and put them there. We will try and make sure we pay attention to that and get back to you. So yeah, post questions as we go. All right. So indicators of native bees in your garden. So about 80% of our native bees are actually ground nesters. So uh, if you're out in your garden, uh, and you see these little mounds with a little hole in there, those are could potentially be our native bees that are nesting. So this little guy, courtesy of Ellen Zachary, our former director of horticulture, uh, these are little sweat bees that are in the process of 
making their ground nest. But these are just some examples of what you might see. And it is easier for them to make these ground nests in a no mulched kind of area that has a little fluffier soil. But you can see from this one, uh, a light mulch is something that they still can get through. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why in some of our areas for habitat horticulture and in the habitat gardens, we try and not mulch in certain areas just so there is a little bit of that room um, yeah. for them to nest. And if you have a deciduous tree nearby, that makes great mulch that the pollinators can get through. Yeah, a nice natural mulch. mulch. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yes. Um, and then also, I highlighted this on a previous program, uh, these really cool, precise, rounded leaf cuts, often on rose plants. Uh, these are from leaf cutter bees, actually. So they don't eat the leaves. They actually use it to provision the nest, kind of make little cells in the ground. Um, or no, in, they're actually cavity dwelling bees. Um, so this is to prepare their nests. Mm -hmm. And you can see, like, I took this photo and then kept checking on this plant. And the leaves don't wither and die from this. So they can still live and photosynthesize. Um, and I think often when we see these cuts, we're like, oh, no, we have to get rid of this pest. But if you can provide this and your plant stays healthy enough, this is a really great way to provide habitat for our pollinators. OK, so uh, we have started offering native annual wildflowers based on some research that the Williams Lab has done at UC Davis. Uh, we've looked at visitation for native pollinators. Uh, both perennials and annuals in the study that he conducted um, that we referenced. But we selected about nine annual wildflower species and wanted to see how they did in the garden. So uh, these two are from my home. And I used some of the species in my front yard because I killed off my lawn uh, and put in some new plants. But instead of mulch, I wanted to use these annual wildflowers as my living mulch this first year as they're growing in. And then as they've died off, I'm kind of stomping them down, crunching them up after they've seeded so that they can come back next year. And they're like my green mulch now. Now, it's not exactly aesthetically pleasing when you have a front lawn, well, not lawn, front yard of brown thatchy material, <laughs> but super functional as things grow in. I think it's going to be really cool uh, and a great way to even boost that opportunity to support our, our pollinators too. And I tried it a little bit in containers. So this is at my house. This is at the terrace garden uh, and uh, need to play around with it a little bit more. Um, I think I overseeded <laughs> in both instances, but you can add them to your container plantings uh, because the flowers you can see kind of hang over the the container you probably won't get them seeding in your pot so it might be the fact that you have to either collect them yourself meticulously or reseed every year so we're testing that out and just wanted to show you a few ways that we've done that um here with the uh dead wood in here that is great for habitat we put in a bunch of different species at the habitat gardens this purple is actually a perennial verbena, but uh, we have a bunch of different annuals in there. And this is both this garden and this garden are, are no mulch. Anything else about um, that? Yeah, another great way to use annual wildflowers is if you have something deciduous in your area and you wanna add interest during the season when it's still growing it back its leaves, you can see it in some of these earlier wildflowers that'll be able to get enough light before the leaf, the tree puts its leaves back on. And also, if you're freshly planting a new sort of garden or yard, you can sprinkle these in. You'll get them that year in their nice, beautiful flowering state. And then you give yourself your plants other time to grow in. And some of these fix nitrogen to the soil, too. So it's mm -hmm. really great for the soil. Totally. Love those lupins. <laughs> lupins! Yes, exactly. They're definitely nitrogen fixers. All right. Uh, and just in general, we always talk about this. You want a good seasonality, so you want to provide 
um, resources for your pollinators throughout the year as much as you can. Uh, we're just going to highlight a few things uh, for different seasons, but early spring bloomers, we have our list here. Uh, these are not all native, but we do want to emphasize native where we can. Mm -hmm. So Ceanothus, Arbutus, Coral Bells, um, Hellebores, and some uh, Ribes. Uh, yeah. So really great, like, great for hummingbirds. These are actually great for hummingbirds. Uh, the bees have a hard time getting into some of these hellebores. <laughs> I was actually took a video of it and it took a lot of effort, uh, but it is, it's one that blooms in the shade. So I wanted to include that. A lot of yeah. times the only things really out already are the honeybees and some of the early bumblebees. So we don't get a lot of diversity at this time, but we still want to be able to pri provide some resources. Yeah, so we have a couple of bees that'll wake up this early with like our native ceanothuses blooming, but mm -hmm. we definitely have our Anna's hummingbirds are active, so it's great to have the ribes and other tubular flowers in bloom. Oh yeah, and as much as there aren't a ton of native flowers that open this early for hummingbirds, grevilleas are amazing for that. They are winter bloomers, so both the coreas, the coral bells, and grevilleas, I, I think both of them are Australian. Um, so we actually, in our hummingbird garden, we have uh, a lot of those represented for our overwintering Anna's hummingbirds. Uh, summer bloomers, just some general categories, the mallows, the asters, which are the sunflower, Asteraceae is a sunflower family, and some garas. So um, it's great to have these pops of color that do really well in the heat. Yeah. And a lot of these are specialists, like I mentioned earlier. There's about seven species that specialize on those asters, and they can also visit the mallows. Oh, did you have something to say, Riley? I was just going to say that asters are a great choice of flower. If you just want, if you only can choose one flower to attract the most things, asters are probably the most big yeah. for your book. <laughs> and we actually have the weedy, not weedy. People consider it weedy because it just grows on the highways throughout this area. But uh, Helianthus annuus, which is a common sunflower, it yeah. gets pretty tall and kind of rigid. So our hummingbirds actually perch on them too. Yeah. So it is, in a way, providing habitat for them as well. Oh, and it provides a bunch of seeds for our songbirds. Oh, yeah. The songbirds love eating these yeah. seeds for sure. Got Super high seed. in fat and proteins. <laughs> yeah, you get one of those ones that produces the big seeds and you can eat some too. <laughs> exactly. Cool. And then just some fall bloomers. Some of these cross over the seasons, but epilobium is kind of our star <laughs> plant for yeah. the fall into like sometimes December. They're still flowering. Um, some Symphiotrichum, another aster, Callilophus, and of course our Rucellia, which is coral. Something. I'm really bad with common names, everyone. I'm all about the scientific. <laughs> um, and so these are some great options as well. Okay. So a little bit about butterfly host yep. plants. Um, so uh, these are all host plants, the angelica, lomatium, and deerweed. Uh, and Calscape is actually a really great place. I think it's put on by CNPS to see which native plants attract which butterflies and moths. So, um, but as you're considering this and you're planting at least in uh, the Sacramento Valley, uh, the Angelica and Lomatium are actually uh, more specialists about who they attract. So they actually attract more of the anise swallowtail, which is one of those yellow and black butterflies. Um, versus the tiger swallowtail, which we have more commonly in the valley. So Anna swallowtails are generally in like the foothills. Uh, and on Calscape, if you look at uh, some of those species, it'll give you a map of their range. So the thing is like, we have both the angelica and lomatium in the habitat gardens, but we don't tend to actually get this Anna uh, swallowtail. So when you're selecting your host plants, you want to be like, huh, is this even gonna benefit anybody? <laughs> Yes, they're they're pretty and uh, they are still useful in the garden. But something like this deer weed right here, which Abby also uh, highlighted uh, last week, this uh, attracts tons of pollinators, but also 
it is host plant for 15 confirmed butterflies and moths. So that's something that we wanted you to consider as you're thinking about this. And it might not be the most showy, it does tend to go summer deciduous or dormant in the summer. So just all things to consider. <laughs> Uh, Rachel, we do have a question. I think it's a All right. one. What do we uh, got? Debbie Turnrose is asking, uh, she is visiting the Arboretum this weekend. Um, so are all these plants labeled? Ah, <laughs> that is, oops, that is definitely one thing that we try to stay on top of. Um, in some of our older collections, we have a lot more uh, plant labels on there. So if you visit Mary Wattis Brown, which is a great established native plant garden, that one has tons of labels available for you. Absolutely. Uh, the Habitat Gardens over by the Arboretum Teaching Nursery and Scrubs, we have a few out there, but it is a newer garden, so we're trying to get those out. But I would highly recommend the Mary Wattis Brown Garden, especially if you're interested in native plants. Yeah. Now, real quick before we get off this, I want to add Calscape has a great function where you can both limit your search to all native plants from your area by putting in like your address or even just Yolo County or something. Yeah. And then you can also sort your search results by number of butterflies hosted. So you can see about how many things host like however many butterflies. Exactly. Yeah. A really great resource. Yeah. I mean, and, and just to look at other web sites, uh, Calflora is specifically on plants, but it gives a range of the plants if you want a map for that yeah. as well. But in fact, when you kind of have to know what your plant is already, it doesn't really help a ton with yeah. like ID and horticultural information. Okay. Designing gardens, Ooh. I use Calscape all the time. <laughs> yeah, as a landscape architecture student, super helpful. Yeah. So really quickly, because we could actually spend a whole separate garden gnomes series on, on this. So pollinator support infrastructure as coined by Riley here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, bee hotels, super fun, kind of trendy, uh, as this is the UNC Asheville bee hotel. Uh, I think they were also a bee campus USA, uh, potentially one of the original ones. So um, we do just recommend that you do really good research because some of the designs are not as good for the bees. Um, we don't want it to be a place where disease festers uh, and we want it to be the right materials. So uh, if we get enough demand for it, we could do uh, one maybe even with Christine Casey at the Honey Bee Haven and we can talk about that because she has a lot of experience and a lot of good notes on how to properly have a uh, bee hotel in your garden. Uh, go, uh, go ahead, Riley. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, just the general rule of thumb to follow is make sure you can either switch out the little bee tubes or you can clean them out between years. And then the other thing is make sure you have some space between them because you don't want too much crowding. Yeah, exactly. And so also there's dead wood. <laughs> <laughs> so an old branch or a limb uh, are actually what has inspired these bee hotels. So this is where a lot of the cavity nesting bees actually dwell. So um, if you have an old branch, if you're pruning your tree, maybe just nestle it into your garden a little bit. Yeah. Um, that's actually, and you know, if it's a softer wood, we actually salvage some of the oaks and cottonwoods that come down in the arboretum and we try and put them in our gardens. And I've seen especially recently, one of the male carpenter bees, the teddy bears, <laughs> kind of looking around one of the newer uh, logs that we put in there. And so lots of things can live in there and they can burrow in either from like old beetle holes or just it decaying already. It's easier for them to get in there. Yeah, you can see in that second picture, they can really serve as striking design features, especially when they start to bleach or some have like interesting twisting bark and all sorts of interesting stuff on branches. Sculptural. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, but one thing on that, we actually had a student organization, I believe, put one of these together with all natural salvaged wood in the Oak Grove. And it was just so much that the squirrels <laughs> got a little excited and just started making homes all throughout there. So it was like really good cover for them, but we didn't really want so much of a community in there. <laughs> so yeah. that's one to consider. So yeah, wood piles are great for habitat. Remember that 
they're great for habitat, so maybe put them a little further away from your house if you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, one or two logs in your garden will be great. Yeah. Um, and then water features. Again, we could probably talk about this subject for a while too. Uh, but bees tend to like muddy, sometimes algae-filled water sources. Uh, one, sometimes because they want the mud for making their nests. Also, uh, it has more nutrients in it for them to drink. So this is like how they get some of their uh, minerals in their diet. Uh, versus hummingbirds need really clean water. It can be a nice slow bubble for flowing water for them to have a little bird bath in. Um, or they are often, if you've irrigated at home, um, they'll fly through the sprinklers. They, they love that. They're very playful. <laughs> so um, one more thing about hummingbirds. If you do have hummingbird feeders, this is another thing. You need to keep them very, very clean. So this is out in the Hummingbird Garden at UC Davis Arboretum Public Garden. Uh, we frequently change our hummingbird feeders. Um, see these little flowers? It's This is where they uh, drink from. Oops, let's get that out of the way. Um, you can see at the bottom left, sometimes they can grow a lot of mold if you do not clean them correctly, and that is very unhealthy for our hummingbirds. So because it is sugar water, um, and if it's exposed a lot, it can grow a lot of this mold, and we really wanna make sure that we don't um, have that in our hummingbird yeah. feeders. And if you see how we set it up the feeders over here, uh, it's been fun to watch them visit, and it's kind of nice to have them by um, a tall shrub, because they actually cue on that shrub to take turns. They also bite quite a bit, but um, it's nice to have like a taller structure nearby so that they can cue up for their turn. Yeah, and make sure you always consider how to keep ants and squirrels and other things out of there. But Oh yeah, even this contraption right here helps deter ants. So you can, you can add that to your um, hummingbird feeder. I think it's called like an ant guard. I think it's a pheromone actually, plus physical. Ooh. I will have to check on that though. Um, okay, so we actually wanted to premiere um, some new garden designs. I am going to exit out of this and Riley will do a little introduction to that. Yeah, these are some garden designs that I've come up with with the help of my co-coordinator, Ricardo Black. And um, so the main idea is these are aiming to provide a lot of habitat value, kind of less conventional garden, but still manageable for the home garden and a nice aesthetic value, utilizing all these things we were just talking about. And uh, also leaving it kind of flexible if you want to have less um, open dirt, if you would like. So yeah. The main idea for these 10 by 10s that we've designed is that uh, we're trying to feature some host plants that are well known in the area. So this one is featuring our good old native milkweed, the narrow leaf, and it's got them in the middle. But we have lots of nice ground covers that'll be around year round because milkweed dies back in the fall. And so these Cenothus valley violet is a ground cover shrub that'll have a nice ground cover element to it. And then we have some Achillium millifolium here that'll have its own, you know, nice ferny leaf foliage, which is great also for our what's called beneficial insects. They love that very tiny leaves they can nestle between and lay their bugs on and the very tiny flowers that they have. And then in the middle, we've got some stumps and logs to help contribute to those nesting habitat like we talked about. A little bit of a water dish or you can go even further with a water fountain if you wanted. And then we have some nice little bee homes and a rock back here. Rocks are great because they provide a good sunning spot that can help bees wake up in the morning, helps lizards wake up in the morning, birds can hang out on it. Rocks are just a great element to have. Oh, and just a note, I don't know if you mentioned it, this is still our draft form. Yeah. So we are still working on this, uh, but we just couldn't wait to share some of these ideas yeah. with you today. So um, these will be cleaned up a little bit and uh, we'll be adding a few more elements to the design of it, but we just really wanted to share. So Yeah. Uh, so also, as you can see, there's a good amount of spots that don't have these little plant symbols in them. And that's to indicate that these are spots to leave bare for the ground nesting bees. You can mulch some of them, mulch all of them, add in your wildflowers, you know, just some options there. Exactly. And this is our uh, sun loving plant yeah. 10 by 10. 
And we'll move on Next. to our shade 10 by 10 here. So this one is mainly centered around our Aristolochia californica, which is the host for the pipe vine swallowtail, very beautiful butterfly and a very funky uh, vine. It reaches up, it's got cool heart shaped flowers and then it's got that pipe shaped flower that you can see in the picture on the left. And that's actually pollinated by flies. So it's got a little bit of a stink to it, but <laughs> it's very, <laughs> very important for our ecosystem. Uh, and then we've got some nice ground covers that surround it. Nice big uh, Frangula californica or coffee berry in the middle to provide support for the vine to crawl up and then die down in the fall. But and then when that the vine dies down off of it, this Frangula will have nice, pretty uh, uh, blackish brown berries that the birds love and they'll go crazy over. Then we have a couple more shrubs in here. We have our Berberus or Oregon grape. Those are another great plant for birds. It's got a nice jagged foliage. It's also got a sheen to it. It's very interesting. Then we also have some ribes here, great for hummingbirds. And then it's got those great berries that are also edible to humans. So if you want to have some snacks. <laughs> they're pretty seedy though. <laughs> yeah, they're seedy. They're great for like jams and other things. Just a little True. bit of work. <laughs> then we have our native strawberry, which is also quite tasty and well-liked by almost all creatures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not to fight things for them. <laughs> yeah, and we then, actually. Yeah, oh, good. Quick note on that. We have those a lot in our Redwood Grove, and they are great for, they are stoloniferous, so they have above ground stems that kind of creep along. So a nice way to fill in between all these different shrubs, too. Yeah. What's it called? And then, yep, last thing we have is our Salvia spathacea, our hummingbird sage. It's got these nice columns of flowers that'll stick up from the ground, but it kind of like creeps and spreads along the ground. Uh, and we have a nice big water dish in this one because it's great to have those in the shade because it keeps it cooler, less evaporation, and then some logs to go in there. Uh, the other thing to consider with water dishes, I don't know if we mentioned earlier, is you want to keep them shallow and you want to put lots of little like rocks and leaves and other things when you're providing water for bees so that they can climb in and get out if they do stumble into the water. Because you'll notice like in pools, they get stuck a lot because there's Aww. no way for them to climb out. <laughs> pools equal death. <laughs> <laughs> they crave the minerals in the pool <laughs> they do they do yeah so that's why it's it's nice to have those other um like leaves and a little bit of mud even in there for sure yeah oh good on that one yeah moving on to these are five by 15s this one was kind of these two were inspired by uh habitat hedgerows it's a project that rachel long works on with the uc davis uh agricultural extension and it's um just a project to bring more habitat into farm areas between their like narrow strips of land. So that's why we've got these rectangular shapes. So this one's featuring three primary shrubs. It's got our Toyon, our Heteronly is a beautiful, a pretty popular shrub already. It's got those nice red berries, birds love them. And then we got another Frangula californica, our coffee berry. So just lots of berries going on for our birds in the winter that is key to our migrating birds. Uh, then we got some Epilobium canum going on here. Great hummingbird plant for the fall. Got Grindelia, it's a very hardy plant. Good times with that. And it has these great yellow aster flowers and it'll shoot up tons of them. They're actually really well liked by all sorts of little bees because the bracts of the flowers have like a stickiness to them. And so, mm. It helps protect the flower from things crawling up to it. Yeah. Hence gum plant. Yeah. <laughs> or gum weed, gum plant. <laughs> those are the main ideas there. We got some nestled in bee boxes that are sheltered and protected, and then a nice little water feature in there too. Okay, we're on to the next. And that was sun. Yeah, yeah that's that was for sunny. sun. And then we got our shade one. This is a bit more of a classic approach to it. We got our trellis in the back there with the Lanicera, which is our honeysuckle vine to climb up it. Then we got some nice, beautiful irises, which are native to California. They're a great little plant, funky flowers. <laughs> and then we have some of our Carpinteria Californica, which, what's the common name of that again? I don't know why it says Elizabeth. Again, this is <laughs> yeah. a girl. <laughs> this is a girl. <laughs> I usually uh, call it uh, I think an anemone egg. or something. <laughs> yeah, California bush anemone or something like that. I think so. Again, yeah. sorry, everyone, common names. To me, it looks like a sunny side ace up egg, <laughs> so I call it egg. <laughs> uh, and then we got a nice big open ground area in this one, so if we really let those uh, irises and honeysuckle vines shine, and we 
kind of also went with the classic heucheras, but these are our native ones. So they're a little bit less showy on the leaves, but still great flowers that are great for our small bees. And you'll see all sorts of stuff on them. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Thank you for sharing, Riley. Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. If there are any last minute questions, uh, we are available to answer any of those, but we just want to thank you all for joining us uh, for National Pollinator Week. We have one more read aloud book that we are featuring tomorrow, uh, read by one of our other co-coordinators in Habitat Horticulture. Uh, and it is a bilingual book called Senorita Mariposa about the monarch journey. So tune in and watch for that on our Facebook Live and we'll also have a copy of that on our YouTube channel. So um, go out there and uh, enjoy <laughs> all the pollinators that we have. So much great local biodiversity here. Yeah. So um, tune in. We did see a comment about wanting a little bee hotel uh, educational garden gnome. So maybe I can get Another partner on that, hopefully Christine Casey, who is on the committee for Bee Campus USA, if she'll join us. So, all right, everyone. Uh, let me check one more time for comments. All right. We will see you next time. Goodbye. Enjoy. Bye.